So well, hello everybody, welcome to the Endocrine Disruptors and Biocides What You Need to Know webinar. First of all, uh, one slide to describe what's going to be the agenda. So first we will start with a presentation on endocrine disruptors and biocides, the impact on new criteria. And then we will follow with, uh, with a presentation on the new guidance for the identification of endocrine disruptors and then a little bit on conclusions, and then we'll save some time for the remaining questions. My name is Simon Gutierrez. I'm an ecotoxicologist working in the biocides uh, unit in ECA. And my presentation is endocrine disruptors and biocides and the impact of the new criteria. The content is we will explain a little bit what's been the journey until, until now. Then we will go through the endocrine disruptor criteria to highlight several uh, elements which are key to understand uh, the impact. Then the expected impact in some of our processes and then a few recommendations and take home messages. So in regards to the journey of the endocrine disruptor criteria, it all started in June 2016 with the European Commission preparing a first draft criteria. Then that went to uh, competent authorities for discussion and then it wasn't until November 2017 where the criteria was agreed and then published. Now in June 2018 we are six months after the publication of the criteria and where the, the criteria becomes applicable. Now thanks to the effort of EFSA, ECA and JRC we have now the guidance published for the identification of endocrine disruptors just in time to start applying the, the criteria. About the endocrine disruptor criteria as such, a few elements which are important to highlight. The criteria is set for humans and not target organisms. So the document established that the ED properties need to be assessed for both human health and non-target organisms, but not necessarily on the organisms the biocide is targeted against. And that's basically for those biocides where the mode of action is through the endocrine system. In the uh, first section of the criteria, it describes the ED properties with respect to humans. And first, it describes or it defines what con constitutes uh, an endocrine disruptor. Then the second stage is how to determine whether the criteria are met or not for humans. And the same thing happens with the non-target organisms, which is section B of that uh, endocrine disruptor criteria. First, it defines what constitutes uh, an endocrine disruptor and then how to determine whether the criteria is met. So what is an endocrine disruptor? A system is considered as having endocrine disruption properties if it meets all of the following criteria. The first one is related to the substance showing an adverse effect in an intact organism or its progeny, or what is called also offspring. The second, um, the second criteria is that it has uh, an endocrine mode of action, that is, it alters the function of the endocrine system. And then the third element that needs to be met is that the adverse effect is, an a, conse is a consequence of the endocrine mode of action. How to assess the properties? The endocrine disruptor criteria establish that the assessment has to be based in all available relevant scientific data. And the, the, the sense of that is that a lot of data has been generated before the new criteria became available and therefore all that uh, data should also play a role uh, even with the new, new assessment criteria. The second important element is that the, all, the, uh, all the information needs to be looked at within a weight of evidence approach. And that considering factors such as relevance of the study, consistency of the results, coherence of the results and between studies and across species, and also biological plausibility of the link between the endocrine activity and the adverse effect, as we explained in the previous slide. So with regard to the expected impact in some of our processes, and we will start with one of our key processes, which is the active substance approval. As you can see in the slide, we've tried to capture the main uh, players on these processes and the main or the key elements in there. The whole um, process starts with the applicant submission of a dossier to the evaluating member states. Then the evaluating member states take some time to prepare the competent authority report. That competent authority report should contain 
the information submitted by the applicant plus the assessment of the of the evaluation member state with conclusions in the different aspects of the assessment. Then the competent authority submitted to ECA to start what we call the committee phase. The first step of the committee phase is an accordance check where ECA makes sure that the competent authority report contains all the necessary information to continue to the next steps. Then we have the peer review phase where the member states can make comments to the competent authority report. And then with those comments, we will go then through the working groups to um, discuss <coughs> scientific or technical aspects of the uh, competent authority report and then prepare the opinion and discuss it in the Biosado Product Committee. Then once the, the opinion is agreed at uh, DECA through the Biosado Product Committee, that is submitted together with the competent authority report to the Commission and the Standing Committee to vote on a specific case and have a final decision on approval. Now that the endocrine disruptor criteria is available and applicable, it all starts from the applicant or the evaluating member states who are the key players in trying to prepare and assess the properties according to the new criteria. Then the dossier, as we said before, will be submitted to ECA, but a main difference here is that ECA will no longer accept competent authority reports which does not contain the uh, assessment of endocrine disruptor properties according to the new criteria. And that's a key element in the, in the process now. So talking about the, the key players or, or the main bodies within this process, the Biosolid Pro Committee gives its opinion. Um, it gives opinions on behalf of ECA on active substance approval and renewal, as well as other processes such as union authorization. And it's through its working groups, uh, in this case for human health and environment, but also physical chemical properties and effic efficacy, where they carry out the scientific work in preparation of these BPC opinions. From now on, all BPC opinions need to contain an ED assessment according to the new criteria. And if an opinion has already been adopted, but a decision is not yet taken at the European Commission and Member States through the Standing Committee, the ED assessment will need to take place before the final decision. So it would mean the competent authority reports will need to be brought back to the evaluating member state or the applicant, depending on the case. We have a new key player on these uh, processes, uh, which is the ED uh, or Endocrine Disruptor Expert Group, which gives advice. The group was established in 2013 by agreement of the competent authorities for REACH and Biocides. And it provides informal and non-binding scientific advice on assessment of ED properties. And among others, it supports screening to identify potential EDs. It gives feedback on the interpretation of available data and identification of further information requirements and a strategy to fill the data gaps. It contributes to the developing of testing and assessment approaches. And it contributes to case discussion within uh, or with the uh, evaluating competent authorities. It's important to highlight that the ED expert group does not take formal decisions. So these remain the responsibility of the competent authority, which may take the advice from the group, but then prepare their final uh, opinion or their final uh, assessment. And it's also within the remits of the BPC and its working groups to discuss and agree on, uh, on, uh, on the physical chemical properties or aspects of, uh, of a particular case. The ED expert group meets uh, three times a year here in ECA in Finland. Basically, is that's, that's the procedure that has been done until now, but as the workload may increase, they may need to meet more, more often. At the moment, there are 50 external experts, and it's also important to highlight that there are open and closed sessions, and experts may be nominated by stakeholders to participate only in the open sessions. And here, as you can see in the table, uh, you can see the, the members that we currently have in the EDX group. So if we look back at the, at the um, process in a nutshell, we start with the company submitting an application and we end in the European Commission taking a decision. But now we have the endocrine disruptor expert group playing a, a key role in the middle. This ED expert group may be consulted at different stages in the process, but it's highly recommended that it's in the competent authority evaluation stage where they uh, consult the group. This consultation can be done once, twice, three times, depending on the case. 
where, for example, a competent authority may ask for advice in terms of data requirements. So they need another study from the applicant and they need advice on which type of study. The ED expert group give, gives advice. The competent authority then constitutes the company. The company provides those studies and then, for example, the competent authority may need to consult again the ED expert group in help uh, to, um, to assess the results of those studies. Again, it may happen that at the BPC working group step, uh, the member states are not able to reach a conclusion and therefore the ED expert group may need to be consulted to ask for advice. As we said before, at the end of the day, the, uh, the European Commission will ask, are the ED properties clearly indicated? And is there a clear con uh, conclusion on the ED properties of the substance? And if not, the case will need then to be, uh, to be sent back to the, uh, to the company or to the competent authority to reevaluate the case. So what are the consequences of identifying a substance as an endocrine disruptor? And here we have two cases. The case where the endocrine disruptor is met for humans. In this case, the substance will uh, fulfill the exclusion criteria and shall not be approved. And that's according to BPR Article 5. And as with any other uh, situation where a substance meets the Article 5, it can still be approved if one of the derogation conditions are met. And that is, for example, that risk from exposure may be negligible or the substance may be essential to prevent or control a serious damage to human or animal health or the environment or that a non-approval would have a disproportionate negative impact on society when compared to the risk. The other case if the, is if the substance meets the endocrine disruptor for non-target organism. And in that case, the difference is that it meets the substitution criteria, but it can still be approved. And that's according to BPR Article 10. In that case, uh, several conditions need to be considered. One of them is that the uh, the product will not be authorized for use by the general public. And the other one is that it will only be authorized for professional use if there are no alternatives on the market. So whenever a product is authorized, it will need to contain an analysis of the alternatives. Also important to highlight that the same consequences apply if the intended biocidal mode of action consists of controlling targeted organisms via the endocrine system. So for those actives which is well known that the mode of action is through the endocrine system, then it will automatically, without the need for further assessment, meet the substitution criteria. In terms of data requirements, um, the one important thing to highlight is the assessment submitted before the 1st of September 2013. The applicants have the opportunity to submit additional information on the ED properties, but it's not necessarily mandatory. On the other hand, cases that or assessment that were submitted after the 1st of September 2013, the authorities can request additional information. They have the right, the right to do so, and the applicant will have the obligation to, to fulfill those uh, data requirements. Now, important to highlight is that um, the submission is understood as when the evaluation authority submits the report to ECHA not when the applicant submits the case uh, at, the, at the beginning. In terms of data requirements, the other important issue to highlight is that, as we said, the evaluation authority may need additional information to assess the active substance and to decide whether or not it has ED properties. And for that, at the moment, uh, we only have the current data requirements, which is within the Annex 2 of the BPR. And those, as we all know, were drafted when the ED criteria and the guidance did not yet exist. So therefore, there is now discussion ongoing on the need or the, the feasibility of revising the data requirements under Annex 2 of the BPR. In regards to product authorization, um, it's now said that a product which contains an active substance, which is identified as having endocrine disruptor properties, would mean automatically that the product is also an endocrine disruptor. Therefore, the applicants and the ECAs or the evaluating competent authorities need to determine in the product assessment report whether the product is considered to have ED properties or not. 
So there needs to be a clear assessment and a clear indication in the product assessment report. And again, uh, if uh, the substance within the product is an endocrine disruptor, then the conditions that we said before would apply or the consequences. So for example, not to be authorized by you for its use by the general public if it meets the endocrine disruptor properties for uh, non-target organisms. What about coformulants? It's now clear as well that a product which contains a non-active substance which meets the endocrine disruptor new criteria, it will lead the product to be also an endocrine disruptor. And um, onto that as well, the evaluating authority has to decide whether there is a need to evaluate a specific non-active substance in detail and if necessary to ask more information from the applicant. But now this is only to be done only uh, when there are indications that a non-active substance may have ED properties based on existing knowledge and the available scientific information. So only on those cases further assessment will be needed on a non-active uh, ingredient. In regards to product families, maybe a couple of things to highlight on the consequences. Um, all individual products of a family may always contain the same active substance and therefore all the products are effective if the active substance is considered to have any properties. On the other hand, if the, uh, the, the, um, the substance having the ED properties is the non-active substance, then it may be the case where certain products in the family are meeting the, uh, the ED uh, criteria. So therefore, only those products will be affected. So as an, as an advice, you must group the affected products in the same summary of product characteristics target for uh, professional users only, for example. So what happens with products already authorized? And this is a condition that, that applies to every product. If the conditions for product authorizations are no longer met, the authorization will be amended or canceled. And this could be triggered when talking about uh, endocrine disruptor properties when there is new information in regards to the active substance or the non-active substance or coformulants in the product. As a product authorization holder, you also have the obligation to notify the Evaluation Authority, ECA, or the Commission if you become aware of such information. And it's important to highlight that if any action is launched or amended or, or there is a need to cancel an authorization, you will be informed and you will be able to submit uh, comments or additional information. In regards to product to be renewed, same principles apply. So again, the evaluation authority will need to assess whether the conditions for the product authorizations are still met. And if not, then um, the authorization will not longer be renewed. So a few take home messages. Uh, we need to start working now. As we said, the criteria is now applicable. So we need to start and you as, an ap as applicants need to challenge the data that you have available and proactively engage in discussions with your evaluation authority. You have to read through the guidance and start working based on the advice. So become familiar with the guidance and start challenging your data with that piece of guidance. Then this is a message for you, but also for us and also for member states that we need to plan resources and expertise to prepare and defend the applications. And for sure, ask for support if, if needed. So to conclude my presentation, the new ED criteria is now applicable. So we all have to start working on it. The new guidance is also available. So we need to prepare now. We need to become familiar with that guidance. And this is a learning process for all actors. So we need to work together to make it work. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and participation. And I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Peter Lepper, who's also the chair of the Endocrine Disruptor Expert Group and we'll talk to you about the, the new guidance. Okay, thank you, Simon, and hello, everybody. Um, yes, in my presentation, I would like to uh, present you the new guidance for the identification of endocrine disruptors, and in particular, the basic uh, principles of the assessment strategy to identify this endocrine disruptors. Um, I'm going to address 
the development of the guidance, then uh, the content of the guidance, the objectives and scope, and um, then as uh, the main part, uh, how to assess the ED properties, so uh, the principles of the assessment strategy, as uh, mentioned. Um, so guidance drafting and consultation that has been carried out by a draft team of ECA and EFSA and Joint Research Center Scientific Staff. And uh, the process started early in 2017 and ended in uh, uh, six months, uh, so um, one and a half years um, overall. Um, but it was not only drafting that took so long, or it took so long because uh, the guidance went through an extensive consultation process. Uh, so overall, we had five consultations involving experts uh, in ED assessment from member states, regulatory authorities, from industry, uh, from uh, NGOs, from academia, and from the general public. Um, the content of the guidance um, is, is shown here, so that is uh, quite normal, and uh, we have an introduction highlighting a bit the background and, and uh, giving a summary on, uh, on the contents, and we have the scope of the guidance, then as a main section, the assessment strategy, but as well the, in the section on information services for endocrine disruptor identification is highly recommended to uh, work through and read because it provides, in the opinion of the drafting team at least, a good summary of the OECD guidance document 150, which has around uh, 1,500 pages, and the uh, chapter 4 has around 40 pages. Then we have a section on recommendations, references, and some appendices which uh, give further guidance on some uh, particular issues. I'm coming now to the objective and the scope of the guidance. And uh, the objective is uh, to provide uh, technical guidance for the implementation of the endocrine disruptor criteria in the context of the biocidal bio products and the plant protection products regulations. And the guidance is for both applicants and assessors of competent regulatory authorities. It de describes mainly what needs to be done so from the applicant's perspective, but from that from assessors it should be quite simple to deduce what uh, they have to um, to scrutinize, check and review to uh, uh, so in, uh, in in their work. Um, the scope of the guidance is that it covers uh, uh, endocrine disrupting modes of action that are caused by estrogen, androgen, thyroid, and steroidogenic, the so-called EATS modalities. And it focuses on uh, endocrine disruptor effects in vertebrates, that means mammals, including humans, fish, and amphibians. Uh, saying that uh, the scope of the guidance is um, confined to the so-called EATS modalities, that does not mean that available information on, on potential non-EATS endocrine disrupting modes of action uh, uh, could be um, dis uh, disregarded, that needs as well to be followed up. And um, this uh, confinement to the EATS uh, modalities is because these EATS modalities are currently the best characterized pathways uh, where there is a relatively good mechanistic understanding of the substance-induced perturbations that may lead to uh, CF adverse effects via an endocrine uh, disrupting mode of action. And uh, the confinement to the vertebrates is as well uh, due to the existing uh, tests that we have and, and, and the knowledge. Next is the assessment strategy, and there are first some general features. So uh, we tried to uh, set up the assessment strategy in a way that, uh, that uh, data that um, are available and are needed are used efficiently. 
the endocrine disruptor assessment starts with the available data. And um, this available data set must, however, be compliant with the information requirements of the biocidal products regulation. Um, generation of further data only when necessary. And available information on mammals and humans and on non-target organisms is used holistically in the assessment. Um, what does that mean, use of holistic use of data? Um, for example, if um, um, if uh, there would be indication in the mammalian human uh, data set uh, on endocrine disruption that would then uh, trigger heightened scrutiny uh, on similar effects in other non or in non-target organisms like fish and amphibia, and of course vice versa. That could as well be uh, the case, and we recommend as well to use the mammalian data. Uh, for assessing uh, potential endocrine effects on non-target organisms. Uh, um, so, um, main basis of the assessment strategy are the endocrine disruptor criteria for biocides and plant protection products. Then there is the OCD conceptual framework for testing and assessment of endocrine disruptors. And uh, the third document is the OECD guidance document 150 on standardized test guidelines for evaluation of endocrine disruption. The OECD conceptual framework lists uh, OECD tests, guidelines, and other standardized test methods which can be used to evaluate uh, substances for endocrine disruption. And it provides guidance on the use of the test methods, but it is not in itself a testing strategy. The OECD guidance document 150 helps in the interpretation of results for the parameters that are investigated in the assays available for the endocrine uh, disruptor testing. Parameters means here the effects that are measured in these tests, like for example histopathological changes, changes in hormone levels, or delayed, um, um, delayed uh, development, or changes in the sex ratio of fish or amphibian, for example. Um, the main uh, stay of the assessment strategy in the main aspect is that it is based on grouping of uh, the investigated parameters that from the available studies. And for that, the ED relevant parameters investigated in the available studies are grouped according to the information they provide. And um, all this is based on uh, the grouping in the guidance document, OECD guidance document 150, and the Joint Research Center screening methodology for the identification of potential endocrine disruptors that had been developed in the context of the impact assessment. Uh, so there are four groups of um, ED relevant parameters uh, or, then, uh, or information that would be in uh, in vitro mechanistic parameters, in vivo mechanistic parameters. These parameters provide information on the mechanisms through which a standard uh, uh, to which a substance is endocrine active. Then we have the so-called EATS mediated parameters. Uh, they are uh, as, as, or monitored, uh, investigated in uh, in, in uh, vivo studies and provide information on adverse effects. But at the same time, due to the nature of the effect and the existing knowledge, they are also considered indicative of an EADS endocrine mechanism and thus, at least in the absence of other explanations, provide in vivo explanation of the endocrine mechanism um, that is resulting in the observed adverse effect. Then as a first group, we have the sensitive to, but not diagnostic of each parameters, are ah, as well um, monitored in, in vivo tests and provide uh, information on adverse effects. However, due to the nature of the effect and the existing knowledge, these effects cannot be considered exclusively diagnostic diagnostic of underlying eats related endocrine activity. Uh, so there could as well be other um, mechanisms uh, be the reason for the um, effect seen. 
but nevertheless, in the absence of more diagnostic, so meaning the its mediated parameters, these effects might provide indications of a potential endocrine mode of action that uh, is relevant for further investigation. Um, we continue with the assessment strategy and we are now going to the different steps of the of the strategy step by step. So the first step is uh, gather all relevant information. Uh, and um, this, uh, all this information needs to be considered and that means the information that is in guideline studies and uh, as well uh, information uh, retrieved from other scientific data selected through systematic review. Um, the evaluation of the data quality uh, needs to be carried out according to the provisions of the biocidal products regulation. And then from the valid studies, um, um, all um, parameters relevant for DS ID assessment uh, needs to be assigned to these four groups I mentioned before. So the in vivo mechanistic, in vitro mechanistic, it's mediated, sensitive to, but not diagnostic of it's. The next step is to assemble, assess, and integrate the lines of evidence. Um, so for that it is necessary uh, uh, to assemble all available data and integrate it into lines of evidence based on the grouping. This, so there could be lines of evidence from adversi for adversity from its mediated parameters and from sensitive to but not diagnostic of its parameters. Uh, and other lines of evidence for endocrine activity from the in vitro mechanistic parameters, the in vivo mechanistic parameters, and from the its mediated parameters. From the its mediated parameters, just to recall, because they not only provide uh, information on adverse effects, but as well on the underlying um, endocrine mechanism. Um, so for a line of evidence, here an example, you find that in table two of the guidance. And um, it may, may be uh, probably a little bit small, but the principle is that uh, here then uh, um, in, in the left sec second left column, you see there's, a, there's a parameters uh, and uh, then you see uh, that from different studies, uh, similar parameters are grouped. And in this case here, we have in uh, so in, vi in vitro uh, parameters, in vivo mechanistic parameters, in each mediated parameters, and they all point to the thyroid modality. But this is just as an example. Next steps is the initial analysis of the evidence. And there, uh, in principle, with five questions, we get to three possible outcomes. And these outcomes are that it's possible to conclude the ED criteria are not met, and that can be done if uh, the each mediated parameters um, uh, have been sufficiently investigated. What sufficiently investigated means, I'm coming to in a minute. So, uh, so. If the its mediated parameters have been sufficiently investigated, and no its mediated adversity is observed, or if endocrine activity is sufficiently investigated and no endocrine activity has been observed, and in this case also no its mediated adversity. So in this case it is possible to conclude that the criteria are not met because one of the elements is missing for the definition of an endocrine disruptor. So if there is no adverse effect, it is not an endocrine disruptor, and if there is no um, endocrine activity, the adverse effect cannot be uh, um, um, based on, an, um, on endocrine activity, the endocrine uh, modality. Um, so the other um, outcome could be uh, that it would be necessary to move to the mode of action analysis, and that is if 
each mediated parameter's have been observed in the data available or endocrine activity has been observed. That is in the next, next step I'm coming later to. So, and there could be a third outcome, and that is uh, that there is a need to generate information. And that is the case if no its mediated adversity and no endocrine activity has been observed, but the endocrine activity uh, has not been um, sufficiently investigated. So, now uh, the explanation when are the its mediated parameters sufficiently investigated. I provide here the example for humans and uh, mammals. And I first should say that it uh, is sufficient normally, or no further data are required than what normally is requested for um, the core um, data set uh, of the uh, biocidal products regulation. And if, if these and if these studies then are carried out according to the actual uh, protocols, so for the EAS mediated, so the, in, uh, the estrogenic or estrogen, androgen or steroidogenesis mediated parameters, it would be sufficient if all the this EAS mediated parameters were seen to be investigated in a two generation reproductive study, so OECD test guideline 416 uh, would have been measured or all the its mediated parameters foreseen to be investigated in an extended one generation reproductive toxicity study so that is uh, always the uh, test guideline 443 for the team mediated so the thyroid uh, mediated parameters there it would be necessary to um, assess the thyroid parameters foreseen to be investigated in the required standard studies for repeated dose toxicity, reproductive toxicity, and carcinogenicity. For the endocrine activity, um, um, there is a, a set of either in vivo mechanistic studies or in vitro mechanistic study available for the different modalities. But this is only required if the its mediated parameters are not sufficiently investigated uh, to go this route. So, and then we have uh, the third option, no its mediated adversity or endocrine activity observed, but the its mediated and endocrine activity parameters have not been sufficiently investigated. And in this case, as already mentioned, generation of further data is required. And um, there are two options, either the assessment of missing its mediated parameters until uh, these parameters can be considered sufficiently investigating, meaning all the parameters normally assessed in the two generation toxicity, uh, repeated dose toxicity study, or in the uh, extended one generation uh, study have been investigated, or the alternative would be to assess the endocrine activity until uh, this is sufficiently uh, investigated. For a conclusion that the ED criteria are not met, a sufficiently investigated data set with negative results is necessary, either on the its mediated parameters or on its endocrine activity. The next step now uh, I'm going to is a mode of action analysis. Uh, first explanation, what is a mode of action? So it is a series of biological events that result in a specific adverse effect. So that is a, a generic description for an endocrine disrupting mode of action. At least one of the biological events uh, involved, uh, in, should involve elements of the endocrine system. And uh, the mode of action analysis is required if each mediated adverse effects or endocrine activity or both have been observed, as already mentioned. So, um, the first step of the mode of action analysis is to postulate one or more modes of action using the available lines of evidence. 
And then it needs to be considered whether the information or of the lines of evidence uh, is sufficient uh, to postulate the mode of action and support it. If the information is sufficient to support the postulated mode of action, it is possible to assess whether there is a biologically plausible link between uh, the endocrine activity and the observed adverse effect or effects, and to conclude whether the endocrine disruptor criteria are met. If the available information is not sufficient, further information it need, is needed to demonstrate the postulated mode of action. Uh, it is important to note that it may not be necessary to establish the whole sequence and relationship of events leading to adverse effects to conclude on the biological plausibility of the link between endocrine activity and adverse effect. Existing knowledge on endocrinology toxicology may be sufficient to conclude on the biological plausibility, in particular if the mode of action is mainly established and empirically supported on the basis of the its mediated parameters. I remember that is because these its mediated parameters provide information on both on the adverse effect on the, on the, on the, on the underlying um, um, endocrine mode of action, uh, endocrine activity. Um, here is an example of a postulated uh, mode of action. Um, so, in summary, uh, the substance uh, does increase serum estradiol in a dose-dependent manner, and this results in continuous estrogen receptor 1 activation in the uterus, and the increased estrogen signaling ultimately results in cancer. And then um, uh, you see here in the bottom of the table then the, the different events and the, the empirical uh, uh, and the supporting evidence. So that is a, 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 a way in which the mode of action could be uh, um, presented in a very simple manner. Come now to the conclusion uh, on uh, uh, on the ED criteria, so meaning whether the substance assessed meets the ED criteria. Um, so, where based on a sufficient data sets, no its mediated adversity is observed, or where endocrine activity is found negative, the mode of action analysis can be bypassed, and it can be concluded that the ED criteria are not met. And that is again because one of the main elements is then missing. Either you have not observed adverse effects in a sufficiently uh, assessed uh, uh, data set, or you have not uh, observed endocrine activity. So, uh, it, substance cannot be an endocrine disruptor. But where a mode of action is based on its mediated adversity, the ED criteria are considered met unless an alternative non-endocrine mode of action is demonstrated and in a comparative analysis found to be the most likely explanation. Then we have uh, a third possibility where an endocrine mode of action is based on sensitive but to but not diagnostic of its adversity and the weight of evidence supports the biological plausibility of the link between the adverse effects and endocrine activity. The ED criteria are again considered to be met unless again uh, an alternative non-endocrine mode of action is demonstrated and in a comparative analysis found to be the more likely explanation. So, so far to um, the assessment strategy and the endocrine disruptor guidance, some take-home messages. Um, the guidance documents provides applicants and assessors from regulatory bodies with guidance on carrying out the ED assessment or evaluating uh, the assessment carried out by um, the applicant. Um, the assessment strategy is set up uh, to use the available data efficiently. Information is required for the core data set of the information requirements for biocidal active substances may in many cases be sufficient to carry out the ED assessment. Generation of further data only when necessary an existing knowledge on its mediated adverse effects may be sufficient to carry out the mode of action analysis 
and conclude on the biological plausibility of a link between endocrine activity and observed adverse effects. With that, I am uh, closing my presentation and thank you for uh, your attention. Um, the webinar ends now and um, you can further submit your questions until 12.15 Helsinki time, that is 11.15 uh, Central European time. The presentations will uh, be posted on our website soon and the video recording will be available on our YouTube channel EU Chemicals.